I am your panel moderator, uh, and we have three lovely panelists uh, this evening. Um, the first one is Brandon Madsen. Um, Brandon is a member of the Reform and Revolution Caucus of DSA. Uh, born and raised in Minneapolis, Minnesota, he first got active in the socialist movement in March of 2004, when he started organizing against military recruiters in his high school and marching against the Iraq war. For the past five years, he has lived and organized in Portland, where for his day job, he conducts hearing research at the Veterans Hospital. He is also a union member uh, in AFGE Local 2157. So the, uh, the next panelist that we have is Jad B. Uh, Jad is a socialist and immigrant living in Portland, Oregon, who believes that the best path forward for a socialist future lies in a united international working class. And finally, we have Rod Such. Uh, Rod is a Gramscian Marxist, and he's interested in the anti-war movement, anti-militarism, and Palestine solidarity work. Uh, in Portland, he's been active with Jewish Voice for Peace, Occupation Free Portland, DSA, Code Pink, and Johanna Hardesty's uh, campaign for city council. Um, so with that, I am going to read the, uh, the panel prompt that all of our wonderful panelists have been asked to uh, formulate responses to. What is the relationship between socialists and progressives? Today, it often seems as if the two are closely related. Self-professed representatives of both categories work with each other on elections, social movements, pressure campaigns, and publish in each other's respective journalistic outlets. However, this has not always been the case. In the 1860s, Ferdinand LaSalle pleaded to the workers of Germany not to join the progressive party of the day, and instead to form their own independent organization. The pre-war SPD was likewise overtly hostile to any and all other progressive political forces in society. In the first decade of the 20th century, there were repeated attempts to form a Socialist Party in Great Britain against the Labor Party. The Socialist Party of America under Eugene Debs opposed both the progressive and conservative wings of capital. And as late as the 1920s and early 1930s, the Communist International was referring to the Social Democratic parties of the time as, quote, social fascists and actively organizing against them. With the threat of fascism looming over Europe and the Soviet Union, the Communist International abruptly shifted this policy to one of the popular front. The Communist Party in the United States shifted from opposing to supporting the New Deal and the Democratic Party against the Republicans, falling in line with the war effort in the process. Since then, the strategies have been more consistent. Socialists have, wor Socialists have worked alongside progressives to further the civil rights movement, oppose the Vietnam War, build the ultra-globalization movement, oppose the Iraq war, and elect numerous Democratic Party candidates to office. Today, of course, socialists have worked tirelessly alongside progressive forces to resist the agenda of Donald Trump, like his continuation of the United States' inhumane immigration policies and the degradation of environmental regulations. How should socialists re relate to progressives today? Are there contingencies that might push this relationship one way or the other? Should there be a delineation between supporting progressives in elections and supporting them in extra parliamentary efforts? How could these relationships be informed by history to respond to the challenges that we face today? And with that, I am going to turn this over to our first panelist, Brandon. Brandon, you may take it away. If I can unmute you, one second. All right, looks like I'm unmuted now. Sorry Great. about that. No worries at all. Um, well, yeah, so because this is a huge topic and these intro talks are supposed to be 12 minutes, I'm going to have to be pretty sharp in the way I pose some of the things, just in the interest of trying to cut quickly to what I see as the essence of the question. And so I might not be able to get into all the examples and history and stuff that would be nice too, but hopefully I can 
at least make my position understood and then we can dive into it in the discussion. So first off, what's meant by progressives? To me, it's a broad and contradictory category that encompasses both liberal capitalist forces on the one hand and genuine working class fighters for positive reforms on the other. And it's important to note, it's not an equal partnership. The liberals, the liberal capitalists play the dominant role and they attempt to set the bounds within which the progressive movement as a whole has to stay. So flowing from that, what is the key task of socialists in relation to progressives? In my opinion, the key task is to break apart that alliance, to end the abusive relationship um, between the liberal capitalists and the uh, working class fighters. And that means convincing the fighters in the rank and file to liberate themselves from being under the command of the bourgeois liberals and instead forge a new healthier alliance with the socialist left, one that's founded on working class interests, grassroots democracy, uh, and collective struggle to meet real needs, not on the basis of what the liberal capitalists are prepared to accept. So why is that important? Why is it important to do that? For one, to help the struggles succeed and to lay the basis for stronger struggles in the future, because I don't believe the liberal and reformist approaches are effective in actually achieving the stated goals of the struggles that are going on whether that's increased wages, um, abortion rights, stopping the rise of the far right, or any other left of center issue, I don't think liberalism or reformism are effective. And I think the lackluster showing of the Democratic Party in the election that we just had is a perfect illustration of the complete political bankruptcy of bourgeois liberalism today. Exit polls showed overwhelming majority support for progressive policy agenda, including things like increased spending on green energy, a path to citizenship for undocumented immigrants, uh, switching to a government run healthcare plan, all of those had at least 70% support according to exit polling, uh, which was conducted by Fox News of all places. Yet with the progressive movement still under the thumb of bourgeois liberalism as embodied by the Democratic Party apparatus, what did we see? Well, A, we saw that the popular vote was much closer than the 70-30 split that we see on the issues, much closer to a 50-50 split. Uh, B, at the state-by-state -state level, we saw states that voted overwhelmingly in favor of progressive policies and ballot initiatives nonetheless go to Trump, like Florida, where 60% voted in favor of a $15 an hour minimum wage. And C, we saw the Republican Party gain seats in the House of Representatives. So even for the stated liberal goal of stopping the Republicans and their agenda, the liberal approach simply is not effective and it's becoming less effective day by day. Uh, this is just the latest example in a trend that you can see over and over throughout history. Um, but uh, let's see. So even if we're on the same page about the goal though, being to break apart that um, unholy alliance there's still the question, what's the most effective way to accomplish that goal? And based on what I've said so far, you might be surprised to hear that my answer is through a united front with liberals and progressives against the right. Now, that might sound contradictory at first, like, wait a second, you're saying that in order to break the progressive workers away from the bourgeois liberals, we work alongside the bourgeois liberals? You know, wouldn't that just do the opposite? Wouldn't that make it look like socialists? also support the bourgeois liberals and fail to provide an alternative. And I think that's a totally reasonable question to be asking, but in order to answer it, I think first it's necessary to make sure that we all have a shared understanding of what's meant by a united front. And so uh, what is a united front? Well, first let's zoom in on the front part. So in this context, a front is when socialists are entering into common struggle with forces that are currently under the political direction of a liberal or reformist leadership. So this would be done on the basis of one or more shared goals, say combating fascism or protecting the environment. Um, the word front here is a military reference. So it refers to a type of military formation where multiple armies fight together on the same side of the battle lines. Each army comes to the front with its own banner, its own leadership, but those leaderships coordinate to fight a battle against a common enemy. And in the process, 
the rank and file soldiers from the different armies find themselves fighting alongside one another in that battle. So, so that's what a front is. It's basically a method for putting socialist forces in contact with the rank and file of the liberal and reformist led groups. Well, as it turns out, there's more than one way to organize a front. One option would be for all the different armies to agree to work under one common leadership, essentially putting down their separate banners and dissolving into one big super army for the purposes of the current battle or current campaign. Um, and that type of front is called a popular front. Uh, you can think of it sort of like how the popular vote is what you get if you dissolve all the, the state by state votes into one big pool of votes. Um, but of course, that's not the only way to go about organizing a front. The other way would be for each of the armies to keep its own banner, keep its own leadership, um, with each openly arguing for and perhaps even implementing its own strategies and tactics, each putting forward its own ideas about what should come next after the immediate battle, uh, et cetera, even as all the armies are nonetheless lined up against a common enemy in the moment. Um, that second type of front is called a united front. So in my opinion, the popular front um, where all the forces dissolve is not a good model for socialists because it makes us lose the distinct features that would allow us to attract the best fighters into our ranks. And it usually means becoming complicit in whatever betrayals the dominant liberal leadership inevitably carries out, which then further erodes our credibility going forward and prevents us from forming a distinct pole of attraction that might appeal to those who are disaffected with the liberal leadership. And a united front, on the other hand, we can openly maintain our differences and put them on display in practice for the whole movement to see with the confidence that our ideas will show themselves in practice to be the most effective. One thing that's really useful about the concept of the united front is that it can be really helpful in avoiding some of the most common types of mistakes that socialists otherwise tend to make uh, in our approach toward broader movements. So the first type of common mistake uh, is what's often called opportunism in Marxist circles. Um, so opportunism is when we're covering up or downplaying our disagreements with liberals and progressives in hope of gaining power or influence or support or acceptance within the movement in the short term. And I would argue that the popular front method I described a few minutes ago is, is one excellent example of um, essentially an opportunist approach, though one could give countless others. Um, the other common fit pitfall that um, socialists have to be careful to avoid is ultra-leftism. And what I mean here by ultra-leftism is a refusal to associate oneself with broader struggles that aren't deemed radical enough or which have too many problematic aspects, things like that. Um, it might be because we're you know, too afraid to taint ourselves and our brand by working alongside liberals and reformists that we know are gonna sell out. Um, but in, in the end, it often results in left organizations playing a role where they're, they're sort of on the sidelines saying abstractly correct things, um, but from a removed position of um, uh, basically preaching from on high about what the movement should be fighting for rather than entering into the real battle of ideas that's going on at the ground level. Or alternatively, it might look like setting up our own sort of pure socialist version of the struggle in parallel, um, which signals our virtuousness to the rest of the pre-existing left, but uh, potentially leaves us either irrelevant or alienated from the wider layer of workers and youth uh, moving into action. So while the ultra-left approaches might seem more radical in theory, I would argue that in practice, they all cede the main arena of struggle to the liberals and give bourgeois ideas a complete monopoly in the main discussion and debates. And so when we do that, we're, we're effectively doing the liberal misleadership class a huge favor um, when we take that approach, uh, as it saves them the trouble of having to find ways to freeze us out or sideline, sideline us themselves. Um, the very last point I want to touch on is basically what does this mean for electoral politics? So one could argue that the Democratic Party in many ways embodies this uneasy coalition between the left-leaning working class and oppressed and the liberal bourgeoisie. And um, so it seems like it's a good target for trying to apply a united front strategy. Um, 
in my opinion, the united front, if applied to the Democratic Party, leads quite naturally and clearly to a dirty break type strategy. And what I mean by the dirty break is the strategy of trying to form a new working class party by breaking the progressive rank and file of the Democratic Party and the unions and the social justice organizations in, that, in those circles away from the liberal capitalist establishment of the party. But to do so in a way that does not rule out struggling in and alongside the Democratic Party as necessary in the process. So I fully support the dirty break approach, but with the following caveat, which is we have to take care that we keep the, the break part, which is the purpose and the ultimate goal of the strategy, in my opinion, front and center the whole time. Otherwise, we risk allowing the united front to turn into a popular front. And we need to be raising our independent banner as socialists high and openly stating our aims of breaking with the liberal capitalist political establishment to form a working class party. Um, a proper united front strategy does not consist in a period of first, you know, hiding and covering up differences, and then later having a period of trying to win working people to our ideas in the future. Rather, it requires that the distinctions be on display the whole time before, during, and after every struggle and campaign and that the independence of the political groupings be maintained the whole time. So flowing from that, I think our dirty break strategy can't consist of you know, a dirty part now and a break part that's relegated to the indefinite future. We need to begin concretely building support for a break from the very start. And I think those of us who agree with the United Front strategy should therefore be um, campaigning right now in DSA um, to for DSA to become more party-like and to openly point toward the goal of a break and the need for political and organizational independence, even as we continue to work closely with others who have not yet drawn those conclusions. So in summary, my position on how socialists should relate to progressives is with a principled, dynamic, united front approach to mass work that neither admonishes from the sidelines nor limits itself to arguing for things that are already popular. So in my opinion, that's the way forward for the socialist movement today. All right, thank you so much, Brandon. Um, next up, we have Rod Such. Uh, thanks, Brandon, and uh, thanks, Conrad. Um, I'd actually like to kind of flip the questions that were posed and um, tackle the very last question first because I think that kind of helps set the stage for how I want people to understand uh, how I'm viewing the progressive movement uh, today. Um, so, you know, historically progressivism has been associated in this country with popular movements that have challenged uh, the worst excesses of capital. And, and there's a continuum there from the Gilded Age in the late uh, uh, 1800s to today. Um, the word progressive even um, became so current that an entire historical period uh, was designated the progressive era, uh, running approximately from the late 1800s to the early uh, 1900s. And the term basically derived from popular struggles against monopolies, uh, which were then identified as trust, and um, popular struggles against some of the most egregious abuses of capitalism, which were ex being exposed by muckraking journalists like uh, Upton Sinclair. Uh, the progressive movement at that time was made up largely of small farmers, some workers, and what was then called Main Street, which is basically uh, small businesses uh, that were threatened by uh, growing monopoly. Uh, monopolization. Uh, one of the earliest legislative results of this era was the Sherman Antitrust Act of uh, 1890. And so let's just stop and think about that for a moment to realize how well that worked out. Um, and I raise this because I think uh, this is, has bearing on our relationship with uh, progressives today, uh, because it helps us to recall a period when um, that really illustrates how reforms and reformism uh, can be uh, undermined and easily uh, manipulated uh, by the capitalist class. 
there's an extremely valuable historical study by the socialist historian uh, James Weinstein titled uh, The Corporate Ideal in the Liberal State. And this book uh, documents how corporations captured the regulatory regime itself and in effect turned the reforms on their head, turned them into their very opposite. Uh, as it turned out, uh, the Sherman Antitrust Act was used primarily against labor unions and preventing workers uh, from organizing. And in the meantime, of course, capitalism, as we know, became increasingly uh, monopolized. Uh, Weinstein's conclusion is really relevant to us as socialists because he basically argued um, it was all dependent on what class was in power. So the uh, regulatory regime, uh, if was uh, controlled by uh, political representatives of the capitalist class, and as a result, the reforms that people struggled for uh, so ardently were uh, easily manipulated and defeated. Um, we then went into a period where there were actually two uh, progressive political parties. Uh, the first was founded by Theodore Roosevelt in 1912, and that was basically a, a vanity project uh, because Roosevelt had not failed to win the Republican presidential nomination that year. Uh, nevertheless, he wanted a mass base, so he raised issues that um, are still relevant today, like um, uh, dissolving monopolies and campaign finance reform. Uh, that first progressive party was very short-lived and it dissolved in 1916. Uh, the second progressive party was created by Robert La Follette from Wisconsin. It lasted from 1924 to 1934. And it actually raised kind of socialist ideas such as government ownership of the railroads and utilities, along with stronger laws to protect uh, unions, eliminate child labor, and uh, actually sought an, into US uh, imperialist intervention in Latin America. Uh, this party was also largely supported by workers and family farmers uh, when farming was still uh, long before agribusiness. Um, but I'm, I'm maintaining that the word progressive actually took on a whole different connotation uh, following World War II. And that's when the third uh, progressive party was created uh, in 1948 uh, with the candidacy of Henry Wallace. Uh, Wallace uh, was a New Deal Democrat who rejected uh, Truman's Cold War policies, uh, who wanted to maintain the alliance with the Soviet Union, and who was a you know, genuine New Deal Democrat. He wanted to implement uh, the Bill of Economic Rights advocated by Eleanor Roosevelt uh, that would have extended the New Deal and given us uh, universal health care um, and um, raising the minimum wage and uh, even entertain the idea of a guaranteed income. But uh, the resulting uh, Red Scare and McCarthyism of that period um, changed everything. Uh, it ousted the communist-led trade unions from the CIO. It led to the persecution of academics, uh, the Communist Party itself under the Smith Act, uh, creative people in motion pictures and the arts. So uh, following that period, the word progressive um, took on a different connotation. It became a kind of euphemism for anyone who was left of center, uh, especially those people who were afraid uh, for good reason to openly identify themselves as radicals, socialist or communist. Uh, this renewed progressive tradition, especially in the late 1950s and early 1960s was particularly uh, visible in the struggles against white supremacy in the Jim Crow South. Uh, the civil rights movement, which in turn um, helped set in motion millions of other people involved in struggles uh, ranging from the fight for li women's liberation to LGBTQ rights, immigrant rights, environmental rights. Um, there were fronts on every, every, against every form of discrimination and inequality. 
Um, and most recently, I think we could identify the progressive tradition as uh, Occupy Wall Street, which uh, in a sense went back to the economic roots of the progressive movement. Uh, throughout this period, the socialist left in this country has uh, helped provide guidance and leadership uh, and has also gone a little further. It's raised the idea that it is not lack of rights uh, that was ultimately responsible for exploitation and oppression, but rather the, the capitalist system itself. And to a great extent, the left has succeeded in changing the narrative in a, in a very dramatic way. Uh, for example, the idea that racism is systemic and that it is not enough to be non-racist, we must also be anti-racist. These have become uh, mainstream, even dominant ideas uh, and has even been taken up by a figure like uh, Joe Biden. Uh, another example is the 1619 project undertaken by uh, editors and writers at the New York Times. It provides us another example of the ascendancy of a radical narrative that's uh, upended the dominant leo neoliberal narrative and led people like Michelle Alexander and Jamil Bowie to embrace the idea of socialism as an alternative system. And let's remember that Bernie Sanders basically ran as a New Deal Democrat. Uh, he railed in a populist way against uh, the quote billionaire class, but he didn't explicitly raise socialism um, in his campaign. It's encouraging, however, that uh, he was still understood to be a socialist and he won millions of votes in both the 2016 and 2020 Democratic Party primaries. Um, so in a sense, what constitutes uh, DSA itself today, um, which has grown primarily because of Sanders and because of the squad, um, DSA is really actually placed in uh, the progressive tradition itself. Um, much more so than in the radical uh, left tradition. So given that we have a vibrant and influential progressive movement today, how does that help us answer the first question that's been posed to the panel, which is basically what is the relationship between socialists and progressives? So from my observations and in, in organizing, I think one thing that distinguishes socialists from progressives is that um, progressives tend to fall into what I would call, uh, what Naomi Klein actually has called the single issue syndrome. Um, basically, they, the progressive movement could be characterized as a collection of single issue uh, causes, such as Medicare for all, the Green New Deal, uh, whereas socialists um, are urging people to connect the dots and go to the roots of the problem. So we're trying to point out that all these issues emanate from the capitalist system itself and the problems that people are struggling against um, are not necessarily addressing the root causes of the problems. So we want to, um, of course, as Brandon pointed out, and I appreciate a lot of his remarks, uh, we are not averse to reform struggles because um, we understand the absolute necessity of building mass movements and strengthening the power of the people through the struggle for reforms. Nevertheless, we have to bring to these struggles the understanding that, that ultimately capitalism must be replaced by socialism. Our reform victories will be merely temporary, incomplete, or as in the case of the Sherman Antitrust Act, uh, completely turned on their head. Um, I'm sorry that I'm um, uh, starting to run out of time and can't address a lot of uh, the other issues. I think I have about 30 seconds left. Um, so I, I think I'll just, um, We'll stop here and maybe we can get into more detail in, um, uh, during the Q&A period. All right, thank you so much, Rod. 
And with that, we are going to go to our final panelist this evening, and that is Jad. Thank you, Conrad. Uh, hi, folks. Um, I want to begin by saying that uh, Brandon and Rod have really raised a bunch of excellent points, and um, more than a few of them were points that I had hoped to hit on myself. So I'm going to attempt to be as unrepetitive as possible. And perhaps the way to do that is to take a little bit of a step back and begin by asking, you know, as far as the question of the relationship between socialists and progressives, who cares or why does that matter? And I think for me, the, the answer to that is rooted in another question which is what do socialists view as the primary force in society that affects positive change? And how does that social force move into action? And I would argue that that force is not a socialist party or a progressive party or socialist or progressive organizations, but the working class itself, uh, a mass militant organized working class in action. And listening to Brandon and Rod, that's why I appreciated so many of the points they were making in that, you know, when we look to history to show us examples of moments in which the struggle against oppression and exploitation, I would argue held the most promise for our side from larger to smaller victories, anywhere from the Russian revolution to forcing FDR to pass the new deal to the civil rights movement um, even to fleeting victories like the ousting of Mubarak in Egypt. Uh, these victories each stem from organized pressure from below. And I think of these, of the struggles that were able to exert the greatest amount of strength, even when short-lived, were the struggles in which the organized left was able to work in solidarity with a militant working class that was able to wield its most effective weapon, the strike weapon. And I think the connecting dot between these moments in history is mass power from below. So I think, of course, the, the, you know, the question today is in the United States, or the, the obvious statement is, there is no such thing as a mass militant organized working class in action. So I think for me, that is where the question lands as far as the relationship between socialists and progressives in that, how do we try and how do we figure out how to rebuild that social force that is most capable of transforming the world into one in which oppression and exploitation are things of the past? Uh, and if that social force is the working class, how do progressives or liberals fit into that? And I think to begin, we have to insist on a sober analysis of where most workers are today, in that most workers are not radicals. In fact, I don't know if you could consider most workers as, as progressives, you know, and to what degree, as Rod was saying, progressives being sort of vaguely described as like left of center. Yet, you know, many workers, perhaps a majority of workers like us, want to see an end to police violence once they begin to see it. Like us, understand the inherent injustice of evictions. You know, want healthcare that is affordable for themselves and their children. And generally want to live a life that is one of freedom, justice, and dignity, right? So the question then becomes, why aren't all these workers DSA members? Or how do we get them to join the DSA? Or to put it another way, how do we convince them to break with capitalist ideology and consider a radical ap approach to changing the world when they still might have faith in those institutions like the Democratic Party or liberal nonprofits, or if they're lucky enough to be a union member, conservative bureaucratic unions, right? And I think this is where we as socialists have to figure out how to strategically orient to these various institutions and the workers around them while avoiding two things. Uh, as Brandon had, had stated, alienating ourselves via ultra leftism or sacrificing our politics via opportunism. And, you know, th the, the fact is we do have to figure out those things because there is no easy answer, right? The, the one lesson that history shows us over and over and over is that there is no magic bullet to revolution. And, you know, the other very important lesson 
uh, shows us is that until the mass of workers in whichever nation breaks with these bourgeois institutions, we as socialists have to be among whichever workers we find there who are struggling for this or that victory, helping them to win that victory if possible, and all the while propagandizing that it's not the power of those on top who are forced to capitulate to organize demands, but the power of those on bottom who force those on top to capitulate. And so, you know, as, as we are confronted, I think, with, with impending struggle and with the struggles we're facing today, you know, we have to figure out how to do this, just as socialists of the past did, in fact, figure out how to do it. And we have to do it without cutting ourselves off from workers who tomorrow might be fellow socialists. Um, I think I think the pitfall is if we are unable to figure out how to do this, we are more tempted and susceptible to, I would argue, incorrectly assume that our own isolated actions, which naturally under the capitalist system will be quite limited and extremely difficult to maintain, uh, will supposedly simply reach and inspire others and you know we'll have revolution next week um kienge yamada taylor who uh wrote the book from black lives matter to, to black liberation and you know to, to to throw in a quick plug we're currently studying that book in the uh political education uh study group right now which is an excellent amazing book uh, and if you're at all interested in that subject matter, I would highly encourage you to join us. We're only on chapter three, and it's very easy to read through, and it's it's been an, an, a wonderful, awesome, lively discussion so far. But uh, one thing she, she once said that I read that has always stuck with me, and I, I'm going to attempt to quote her probably poorly, which is that the way a liberal becomes a socialist is that they get fed up with this horrible system. They try to change the system using the standard methods we are taught or what responsible citizens do, and they fail because the system is rigged against us. But instead of becoming demoralized and inactive, they have a socialist fighting right alongside them who's been engaging them with debate and pushing them toward more radical ideas, strategies, and possibilities. And, you know, even though, you know, this isn't true in every single case, but, um, you know, it's something that has always stuck to me because at its root, I think it's very true to the experience of many. And I think that's the part that we always have to remember. You know, where are we at right now? Where is everyone else? And how do we reach those who are potentially close to our conclusions? And of course, it would be great, again, to, you know, skip working alongside progressives, reformists, liberals, and simply do our own thing because it's very easy and straightforward. But that's simply not the realistic terrain that the left currently occupies. We're still very tiny. We're still alienated from most people. And the truth is that working alongside these organizations or coalitions is, in fact, very dangerous terrain and is always difficult to try to figure out, especially since the terrain is varied, right? It's going to be difficult in a different way to try to figure out how we strategize working in the vicinity of a local Democrat city council member than it is dealing with a conservative union membership, union leadership, excuse me, although oftentimes much of the membership is, is conservative as well, in that both contain different but equally dangerous pitfalls. But I think, again, to flat out ignore or abstain from such situations is often a mistake in that I think, you know, in our goal to build toward revolution, what are we essentially trying to do? And I would argue, one, increase worker militancy as much as we can wherever we are always Two, win reforms in the here and now, not as a substitute for more revolutionary goals, but because first they improve people's lives, you know, to some degree, which is very important, but because they embolden not just the, the, the radicalizing workers that we're working alongside, but ourselves, in fact, as to what is truly possible and on the horizon. And three, because as has been mentioned before, that work uh, shows our fellow workers the limitations of the liberal institutions where those workers might currently still be pinning their hopes. 
especially I would argue in moments like the one we're occupying in the present day, especially considering the Black Lives Matter movement and this recent election in which I would say many working class people are questioning the nature of a number of bourgeois institutions to a degree that I haven't seen in my life. And I would imagine many of our older comrades haven't seen in a very long time. But I think the key here is that we need to be there alongside them, advocating our strategies and our political perspectives as an alternative. Because when people don't see an alternative they view as viable, even if they have, they begin to have those misgivings. If an alter alternative doesn't present itself, they do tend to fold back into acquiescence. And so, you know, yes, there are always going to be victories, but there are always going to be, excuse me, failures, but there are always going to be victories as well. And, you know, thinking through this question, uh, a couple of, I think, pertinent examples spring to mind. One is what has been referred to as the Red State Revolt, in which, you know, a couple years ago, a number of incredible, inspiring, and very powerful teachers' strikes swept through a number of southern states, oftentimes organized uh, in part by local socialists. And I think it's important to remember that, you know, in those unions, were the union bureaucrats at the top exemplars of radical action? Of course not, right? But did that stop radicalize, radicals and radicalizing workers from agitating inside those unions? No, it didn't, and thankfully so. And you know, another example I would think to throw out there, which doesn't really quite fit into the you know radicalizing worker inside a union mold that we so often study in history, but I think is is still very important, is our own very local and very wonderful universal preschool for all campaign here in that you know i think it's remember it's important to remember that campaign to in this discussion and that we don't necessarily want to be mechanical in the way we orient to struggle in that any piece of the terrain we currently occupy is potentially one in which we should weigh and strategize around so you know thinking of universal preschool what did socialists do they organized themselves and non-radicals to win a reform that is in the here and now, in and of itself, not at all revolutionary, but fantastically helpful to the lives of working people and can be used as an example of this is what socialists do. And speaking to what has been spoken, has been mentioned before, this is an example of the limitation of depending solely on liberal agencies, right? And that I recently learned that in the campaign, the county initially pushed for means testing as a qualifier for preschool care, but it was the DSA that fought back against that. It's important to show our, our fellow workers that it's the DSA that is fighting that fight. Because to me, you know, essentially what it boils down to is as we strategize, um, the core of the relationship between socialists and progressives is the rate relationships between socialists and those that we want to make socialists. It's empathy for our fellow human beings who are not yet where we're at. And realistically, how do we meet them where they're at so that we can shift them leftward? Because I think ultimately the, the, the core lesson is if we don't start the painstaking, often slow work of truly rebuilding mass politics from below, we're never going to be able to see the world that we want to live in. Thank you very much. All right, thank you so much, Jed. So we are going to go over into a little bit of response time for the panelists now. Um, each one will have five or so minutes to uh, take up any points that they want to develop further um, or, or, you know, provocatively respond to uh, their co-panelists if they so wish. Uh, we'll be going in the same order that we um, originally did, which means that Brandon is next. You can take it away. All right, looks like the unmuting succeeded. Um, yeah, thanks uh, to Conrad and to my fellow panelists. It's been a, a great discussion so far, I think. Um, and it's good that we're, uh, I liked that in Jad's uh, portion here, we started getting into some 
some more nitty gritty, um, you know, examples and complications and things like that. Cause yeah, I think there's sort of the general framework, but it's a, you know, real life is always more complicated than even the most sophisticated theory and doesn't fully prepare you for, for any, you know, individual situation. So I think that's, that's important to, um, do that. My, Temptation, frankly, from reading the chat, though, what's on my mind is to sort of start responding to some of the more interesting things I'm I'm seeing. Though I, I hesitate to, uh, you know, jump the gun on on questions people haven't asked yet. And my, anyway, that we'll get to in a moment. So I'll try and try and resist that uh, temptation as much as I can. But I think uh, sort of to pick up where. Um, Jad left off in the in thinking about how do we move the working class into action and how do we um, you know achieve this sort of uh, radicalization that we all think is is necessary um, given the messiness of these situations and to me I think one important thing is to come back to the need for an organized working class party. Um, mainly just because every other force in society like has yeah has an organized presence that it it fights for its ideas it's a place where people can come together and and both do work and debate out what those ideas should be um sort of collectively process be like the brain of of the operation that can learn lessons and process from all the experience and um that you can yeah you grow over time um and I think that, you know, that as socialists, um, I think one of the reasons why we're talking about progressives today, as opposed to, you know, like we could be talking about how to do socialists relate to conservatives or whatever, you know, there's other forces in society, but, but I think in some ways, a way to look at it is like, I don't think the sort of small layer of revolutionary socialists is going to directly you know, in ones and twos or whatever, like win over um, the working class as a whole until they all, you know, join whatever group or party or whatever we set up. I think history has shown it doesn't work that way, that it's more a question of gaining broad influence for uh, a set of ideas and having those, inf those ideas sort of spread in through movements as people start trying to take action to, to improve their conditions. Um, and I think that, because, but the question is what's the relationship? How do those social ideas spread throughout the movement? And to me, that's where what is sometimes called like the advanced layer of the working class or whatever the, the politically advanced layer comes into to the picture. Um, this is sort of, I don't know, People might have heard the the phrase "vanguard party" get thrown around in the past, and I think it's misunderstood and misused. In that, it people think it means like, "Oh, it's us socialist revolutionaries that are the vanguard, leading the way for for the working class and everyone else." But but actually, what it means is there's like any other group of people, the working class like doesn't all move into action at once. There's there's a section of the working class that starts drawing these further reaching conclusions earlier than than others that start moving into action earlier than others that might be more vocal, sort of the natural organizers and leaders um, in their communities. And uh, the idea of a vanguard party is it's a, it's a party that, that orients to that layer of workers, that basically tries to get that layer of workers on board with its ideas. And I think, um, I think that's a good strategy. I think socialists um, should try and aim their fire in um, trying to win over the advanced layers of the working class that that uh, are drawing the the furthest conclusions earliest, and we can kind of be the small wheel that turns the somewhat bigger wheel that then, in the long term, turns the really big wheel of the working class um, as a whole. Um, but our tiny wheel isn't going to turn the working class directly. So I think that's where the progressives' angle comes in here, and and sort of I think. Yeah, it's the layer of the work. The working class people that are drawing progressive conclusions today are the are the ones that are leading the struggles on issues like Medicare for all, Green New Deal, um, fifteen dollars an hour, et cetera. 
and are going to be when other workers start looking to move into action, they're going to be the ones that are that are looked to by their coworkers. So. All right, thank you so much for that. And uh, next up is Rod again. Um, one of the points that I wanted to elaborate on was um, uh, the importance of electoral struggles because I see the uh, election cycles as being really crucial to uh, bringing progressives out of their silos. Um, in an election, you can present a candidate um, who connects the dots and unites all the issues and comes up with a program that can rally uh, the multiracial working class and their allies. So um, to me, that's the key part about the importance of DSA taking part uh, in these um, electoral struggles and um, uniting people around actually a, a program um, and showing at the same time as socialists that um, uh, all of these issues are systemic and ultimately um, can only be solved uh, through a socialist system. Um, I agree with uh, Brandon about uh, the idea of a dirty break. Uh, historically, um, we can see that uh, this country is a two-party system. Uh, we're, we're kind of stuck with that. Um, the only time that a third party has really emerged as a major mainstream party uh, was the Republican Party over the question of slavery. Um, and I actually believe that uh, one way uh, the dirty break would result is over uh, the issues of white supremacy, uh, male supremacy, war and empire. Uh, those to me are going to be the issues that will radicalize people and um, will ultimately lead people to want to break from the Democratic Party um, and set up a socialist party. But I also uh, think that Jad, Jad's point is very well taken too, that in between those election cycles, um, the day-to-day -day struggles of, of working people uh, are so important uh, to engage in. And um, another place of radicalization is, is right on the job at the point of production, uh, uh, not having any kind of democratic framework in your, in your workplace, having to deal with abusive bosses. Um, the whole, uh, whole range of uh, issues, I think, uh, are really key for um, DSA to, to pay attention to um, and help build um, that third party, that eventual third party mass party that will um, uh, strive for um, a true break from uh, capitalism and imperialism. Uh, so I'll leave it at that. I, I see a lot, there are a lot of good questions in the Q&A and I'm looking forward to going deeper and addressing a lot of those too. All right, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for our panelists. Um, the first two questions that we got, I think might be of sort of similar content. So the first one um, that I'm going to solicit from the audience is from Marina. Um, and I'll just unmute you and you can feel free to ask the question live. Oh, oh hey. Um, so I was going to ask uh, basically about the question of liberalism because what liberals can do and capital as a whole is, is the ability to recuperate uh, radical ideas. Like you have these ideas and these movements that challenge capital and then what they can do is incorporate that into their branding and then create kind of a half measure solution. But then they say to you, like, anything going further is just going to dismantle all this progress and you're just, you know, pushing too far. Can't you compromise on this? So liberalism has this advantage of like recuperating these radical ideas. When we work with liberals, how do we prevent um, 
ourselves from becoming opportunists? How do we prevent this idea of capitalist realism where people can like basically push to make capitalism as ethical as possible or, uh, you know, corporations to be responsible because they really like, you know, after having all this pushback and being pushed into a corner, I notice when I go in the store, they put it into their branding of like, oh, we're so good, we're so ethical. How do we combat this like ideology and stronghold that they have over our um, struggles um, to, you know, help people? Sorry, that was a little long. Yeah, no problem. And it actually uh, occurs to me that I have skipped Jad's uh, chance to respond to his co-panelists, which is totally my bad. Um, so perhaps, uh, Jad, if you want to you know, respond to anything that Brendan or Rod have said, and maybe weave um, some answers into Marina's question as well, that would be really wonderful. Uh, sure. For the sake of time, I think I'll just skip my my six minutes because, again, I don't want to be too repetitive, and I feel as though maybe the question and answer session will be better place to raise any sort of disagreements or or good debate. Um, I, I think to attempt to answer Marina's question, I think again, our you know, uh, step one would be to evaluate where we're at, right? To to realistically assess our own strength and determine what we can do or determine where we can where we can fight to have the biggest effect possible right so so and i think it's it's difficult to answer that that concretely um, without you know a very specific arena to look at but one example that springs to mind is you know back in 2017 here in portland when um when uh, those two Muslim women were getting harassed on the train, and uh, those, uh, and then you know the two men were killed by by uh, the uh, the right winger, and he almost killed the third one, and um, that you know galvanized the the right to invade our city, and the Portland Stands United Against Hate Coalition was formed. And it was initially built by socialists and pushed hard by socialists. And it brought into its wing um, progressive organizations and their membership. And unfortunately, the coalition was short-lived and I think did not was not able to live up to its, to its potential. But in that milieu, in the organizing for that milieu, um, I don't know if many people know, but uh, Jesse Jackson flew to town and attempted to convince the coalition to stand down. Like you were saying, Marina, don't push too hard. And he attempted to push the coalition toward a direction of disbanding, not holding a rally, and that the safer, more, I don't know, responsible tactic would be to make sure to get out the vote in the next democratic election cycle. Um, our side won that debate because it was prepared to push back and we were simply on grounds in which we knew we would be able to do so. And so I think those are the areas right now in which we have to find. And I think that another way uh, to offer a small, uh, uh, Conrad, am I, am I going on too long here or am I good for a little bit more? No, you're totally fine. Okay, great, great. Um, you know, we, basically to find those areas in which we can intervene, right? In which we can spread our ideas. And like Brandon was saying, not necessarily like convince one person, then another, then another, but to essentially propagandize our ideas in, in, in as broad, broad a manner as possible. And yes, I do agree with the other two panelists that the electoral strategy should not be ignored in that regard. But one, one, one area in which I wish we had done something more would have been, say, um, the recent Black Lives Matter uprising, in that I really wish that, you know, I, I, I've heard and I totally understand the apprehension about an organization like the DSA entering that uprising and, you know, uh, the the, co the co-optation argument and we don't want to be seen as co-optation and I, I I hear that reservation and I understand it but I think that socialists like one of the duties of socialists is to find 
a, 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 like a third alternative path, right? We don't want to enter a movement and attempt to co-opt it, but we also don't want to uh, abstain from entering a movement. I think uh, a, a better path may have been to enter as the DSA. And I think we could have simply say, I don't know, uh, as an organization entered the movement as a visible socialist alternative to the liberal policies that we were hearing a lot from the front, right? And we could have simply entered as like a bunch of DSA members wearing, I don't know, DSA shirts, all carrying signs that, that simply said, DSA stands in solidarity with Black Lives Matter, right? And I know if I had been there and someone came up to me and said, why is DSA here? I would have simply said, because I believe that the only way that black liberation is possible is through socialism. And the only way that socialism is possible through black, is through black liberation. So I think those are the arenas in which we have to try to spot and then strategize how to enter effectively so that we do counteract that liberal co-optation of radical sounding rhetoric. All right, thank you so much. So since uh, we have another question that's kind of similar, I'm going to read that one as well before uh, throwing this to our other panelists. Um, this one is from Laura. What would you say to leftists who don't want to be in coalitions with liberals because of the risk of co-optation or our perspective getting drowned out? Is that a real danger? And if so, how do we combat it? Well, I'm happy to come in on this. I don't know uh, what the right order is for for folks. Is that cool? I don't think we have to worry about okay. order. I'm <laughs> just jumping in. Okay. Um, well, yeah, I think uh, on that last question that you just read out, I think, again, that's a really understandable um, concern, like not wanting to get um, steamrolled by the liberal leadership of coalitions or whatever. Um, and because of course we think those ideas are a problem, but I guess to me, the, the question would be, what's the alternative? Like if we don't engage in those coalitions, then we're guaranteeing that, uh, you know, the mainstream of that movement is that that ground is dominated by um, the liberal viewpoint and that there's not some alternative there. So, you know, First off, even if there's limitations to what we can do, I think um, being there is still better because at least there's there's some challenge going on. And I think like, um, I don't know, maybe I feel like sometimes uh, when I talk to leftists that have mainly been involved, you know, after it's become in the sort of Occupy Wall Street or later time frame, like there's a lot more of an expectation that we should only get involved in thing in like uh, political fights that we can win or things like that. Uh, period. But I guess as some, from having been around, uh, you know, substantially longer than that, I feel like most of my time being active has been when there's you weren't expecting to win those arguments. You weren't expect, you were only expecting to win over one or two people at a time. And you knew you were gonna lose debates with liberals and coalitions and things like that. And that's just normal. Um, I think it's still useful. I think it's still helpful to go in and um, try to make the case. And I think the other thing that I think like, one thing that gets you political a political following or political capital is if you say, you know, in a coalition meeting, I worry that if we go down this route, you know, that these problems are going to emerge, that these deficiencies are going to be there and to say that in front of everyone. And therefore I think we should do this other thing instead. And I think if your if you're progno prognosis ends up being correct, then I think, you know, the best people are gonna see that and are gonna, you know, wanna, um, be more apt to listen to you next time around. And so it is, there is a process of sort of like gaining trust within a movement and you can't just sort of walk in and expect to have it off the bat. Um, but that doesn't mean it's not worth uh, being part of it. So I'll be disappointed and stop there. <laughs> Uh, you know, I, I'd just like to, to riff off a point that uh, Chad made because I 
it's one of the things I wanted to raise in my presentation. Um, and that is uh, the importance of uh, us getting involved with the Black Lives Matter uprising. Um, you know, DSA is, is a big tent and uh, people bring a lot of different passions to what we wanna be doing in DSA. And I think that makes it a real challenge for the leadership. Uh, and I appreciate those challenges. But I also think that we have to have our thumb on what are some of the most key issues um, that um, are blocking the working class and their allies. And uh, white supremacy, I think, is chief among them. So there are times when um, you know, you're trying to kind of play the piano and recognize everyone's passion and what they want to take on. Uh, but there are other times when you have to strike certain chords that really resonate because there are such key struggles. And so that is uh, one point where I think um, leadership uh, is so key to direct people to say, you know, we have a lot of struggles going on right now. We're undertaking a lot of issues, Green New Deal, Medicare for all, but we also have an unprecedented national uprising taking place all over the country. And um, this is where we need to be right now. This is one of the um, most crucial issues of facing our country and we should go all out. And as you say, you know, your, your intention is not to co-opt it, but to demonstrate the importance of it and give it strength and give it a lot of your energy and a lot of your focus. So that, this is another uh, place where I think um, we have to see where the progressive movement is going spontaneously and where we can enter those spontaneous struggles and help give them leadership and direction to really produce some concrete results. And thanks for all of those. Up next, we have a question from Andoni who uh, has asked to um, present it live. Uh, unmute. Great. Okay, great. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, thanks for your, the presentations. They were really insightful. I have a lot of thoughts in my head. Um, I, I wanted to pick up on something that Rod raised at the beginning of his presentation. Uh, I got the sense that one of the ways that he would uh, characterize progressivism is incomplete that only socialism could be the uh, comprehensive enough in its progressivism. And I wanted to see if all the panelists agreed with that. Is the issue with um, socialism and progressivism is you know, the magnitude of the progress made uh, of the kind of reforms that can be advanced or is it something else? And that leads me to the second part, perhaps the most comprehensive progressivism in the United States is the New Deal. And I thought here, Jad and Brandon may have a, a point of disagreement. Jad was pointing, I mean, Brandon was pointing out that um, the popular front, he sort of raised the popular front versus the united front. And the New Deal is sort of, a, you know, a exemplar of a popular front kind of coalition, uh, which Brandon warned about, but it also had the, uh, Jad mentioned that it was sort of characterized by popular uprisings. Uh, popular uh, support from the bottom pushing these reforms. And so I wanted to hear um, how uh, Jad and Brandon sort of consider those two political dimensions um, um, and how, um, yeah, how they consider them, how they round that out. Do you wanna go first, Jad? Go ahead, I'll go after you. Okay, sounds good. Um, I, I'm not sure that there's a disagreement there. I don't know, like I'll, I'll wait till what, to hear what Jad says, but I, I didn't uh, understand it to be a disagreement between us. I think in some ways it's two different questions. I think there's, I think to be clear, I also think the New Deal was a, a positive reform, a positive accomplishment. Um, I also think it was more limited than it, you know, could have been or needed to be um, in that situation. So I think like um, the positive aspects of the New Deal, they were there, yeah, because of the popular uprisings that were taking place and because of the 
uh, political context at the time that forced uh, Roosevelt to, to confront that and to do something about it. He was trying to essentially save capitalism from itself because he feared that, you know, if uh, the most rapacious sections of capital got their way that there would be an uprising that capitalism couldn't contain and, and it would be faced with an actual revolution. And so this was a way of trying to, to balance and, and buy some time, buy off the working class to a certain extent. And um, I think that um, that's something that the European state, like coming out of, out of uh, the situation in Europe at the, the same time, both before, during and after World War II, you know, it was much, they did not have the um, sort of wherewithal to devote to, to similar projects. And when you did see the like, sort of um, uprisings take place in, in Europe after the war was over, it was, they were confronted very clearly with the question of, um, are we gonna side with corporations or are we gonna side with the working class? And they had to pick because they didn't have all this, they did not have the biggest economy in the world and sitting on top of all this, this money to um, throw around or whatever like the US did in the post-war period. Um, they were able to, they, they had, to, had to pick. And, and because of that, the struggles reached a much sharper pitch. Um, and you got really far reaching reforms, much further reaching reforms than the New Deal ones um, in the post-war period in Europe, um, carried out by, uh, ultimately it was with the same motivation in that you had reformist socialist parties come to power and save capitalism from itself again, but um, they had to go a lot further to save capitalism from itself uh, than, than the US did because of that. So all that is to say, I think that the New Deal is absolutely something that should be celebrated and we should point to the working class as the agent of it. However, I wouldn't say that it's because of the popular front approach. I would say it's despite the popular front approach and you know, a strong, um, visible, independent socialist uh, streak within that, um, which also did exist, by the way, not all the socialists were carrying out a popular front strategy. But I think that that develop, that dynamic being developed would have made even bigger gains possible um, is my analysis of that situation. Before other panelists go into their answers, I wanted to resurface the uh, kind of first part of the two-part question that was presented on um, you know, the characterization of socialists as kind of more or more comprehensive uh, or complete um, progressives. Um, you know, I think uh, Rod um, may have made some gesture of this and maybe Jad, you quoted Tiangi Yamada Taylor um, uh, speaking something to this effect as well. So, you know, if we could hear about that a little bit uh, too, that would be great. Rod, do you want to go, or would you like me to go ahead and jump in? Uh, you go ahead, Jed. OK. Uh, I'll be brief. Um, so I, I also don't think there's really disagreement between myself and Brandon. I think, I think that the New Deal speaks to that working class militancy. And I would advocate for a united front model as well, because I think also one of the strongest advantages of the united front is that it so very effectively allows us to build on the achievements, on the victories that we achieve. Um, and I think, you know, that might require a whole other panel to go into discussion of like the political dynamics that were at play leading up to the New Deal. Um, uh, so so uh, to tackle that first part of, of the, the question, so, so I would say yes. So essentially, you know, I think what a socialist does is when they hear something like racism is systemic or to hear a progressive say racism is systemic, I think the difference is the difference between a socialist and a progressive to, 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 to be as, as brief about it as possible is the difference in what they say about what we do about the system. And also how does racism itself fit into that system? Why does, why does the system perpetuate racism? And uh, 
you know, it looks like Rod is maybe ready to jump in. So I'm going to cut myself off there, Rod, and you go ahead and jump into that. Yeah, yeah I, I think if I, if I presented it like a, a socialist is just a more complete progressive, I didn't mean to convey that. Um, I think we do have to spell out exactly why um, uh, only socialism could eliminate um, systemic racism and educate around the, the roots of um, capitalism, and especially historically in this country, white supremacy was a feature of it from the very beginning, even before it was really, it was really more of a mercantile economy than it was a capitalist economy. But um, uh, the relationship between capitalism and slavery, for example, is one of the key lessons that we have to provide and bring our education to. So we're ultimately, we're talking about um, social ownership of the means of production. Um, we have to get rid of um, a system of for-profit um, by a tiny class that we have irreconcilable differences with. So um, there, there is, socialism is more than just complete progressivism. It's a complete break um, with settler colonialism, with capitalism, uh, with the way that things have been run in this country uh, forever. Uh, but how we get there is, is by engaging in reforms that help build working class strength and help show the alternative. So it's a, it's a big ideological struggle too. The ideological component of that is, is huge because um, there's a whole infrastructure that the capitalists rely on through the media, through the trade unions, through so many uh, uh, aspects of civil society to convince people that there is no alternative to capitalism uh, but don't worry, you know, capitalism can be regulated and capitalism can be reformed where it's, where it's not doing things correctly. Um, and uh, we have to be prepared really to focus in large part on that ideological struggle. Um, and that's really what social, the weapon that socialists bring in particular is to show that um, no, um, a capitalist system with a capitalist class in power will never be able to address all these issues. Um, and then just empirically it can be demonstrated, but um, we also have to, to uh, bring some socialist theory into the struggles too to show why we uh, disagree with that perspective. And I, you know, I, I think that it is a real concern. It's a real, I mean, so many people in the progressive movement who are not averse, are not hostile to radical ideas, but uh, they just uh, reject socialism as the alternative um, because uh, command economies in socialist countries didn't work uh, because there were so many human rights abuses in uh, socialist countries that people reject that notion. Um, and then they look at uh, Europe and uh, particularly Scandinavian countries and they see a social democratic model that uh, you tax the hell out of the rich and um, people have a much more decent life. Um, so there's a lot of progressives are not convinced that socialism is the answer and, and they, they uh, favor a social democracy or very well regulated uh, a capitalist system. Uh, so we have that struggle to show why uh, ultimately it's probably not going to work, especially in the United States. All right. Um, up next, we've got a question from Jamie, and this one is addressed to Jad specifically. How would you define militancy? Does that mean violence, property destruction, or rather collectively standing up to authority, refusing to comply, refusing to produce, withholding labor? which can involve strict nonviolence. Yeah, simply put, I define militancy as workers fighting on their own terms to get what they want, period. And I would say that when we, when we use words like violence and nonviolence, I think these things are tactics. That's how they should be viewed. And tactics should be applied as we think they would be best 
fit to win us the victories we are attempting to achieve. All right. Um, the next question that we have is from Danny, and it is to everyone. Uh, is the relationship of socialists to progressives any different than the relationship of socialists to conservatives? Progress under capitalism is contradictory, nonlinear. Capitalism needs to change to preserve itself, and progressives regularly play the part of more sophisticated conservatives. Likewise, those who identify as conservatives, even in their illusions about a past, they often embody greater optimism and horizons of what is possible even in, quote, make America great again, than progressives. Why favor progressives? And I will uh, copy this into the chat in case people want to uh, you know, review the question a little bit. Brandon, do you have any initial thoughts on this one? Well, I feel like I sort of uh, maybe anticipated this one earlier in in something I said, so I probably won't, you know, go too much into it. But um, so yeah, I mean, I think the reason, as I said earlier, that you would that you would uh, you know focus on progressives more so than conservatives is not because conservatives can't be one, but just that. Um, Basically, you want to go for the a. You want to go for the low hanging fruit because you're always trying to get people to get closer to to your ideas and build your your sort of core forces um, more quickly so that you can have a bigger impact on the overall discussion in society. Um, and then b because those who are drawing progressive conclusions tend to be more politically. Um, are more politically advanced um, or active generally, uh, and therefore have more influence in the wider working class uh, when people start looking to move into struggle. And so in the interests of sort of cultivating um, the, the sort of leaders, the organic leaders within the, the working class, um, I think the progressive layer is the, the place to find them more than anywhere else. If I may quickly add to that. Go right um, yeah, to, big, to piggyback off of that, I think, um, you know, it is also dependent on where we currently at and what sort, what, where we're currently at and what sort of situation we're facing, right? In the sense that like, in that example of the red state revolt of teachers, you know, going into strike in those Southern states, you know, I wonder what percentage of those teachers would consider themselves conservative. You know, I wonder what percentage of them would describe the self describe as progressive. Uh, but I think that's the great thing about struggle, right, is that as, as you know, when we dive into struggle, how those specific terms become less important than what workers are learning as they engage in struggle. So I think that, yes, I agree with Brandon, we need to uh, Right now, I think we, I would say we need to orient towards those who are just to the right of us, more or less, to put it maybe a little bit crudely. Um, but there are going to be times in which, of course, we're not going to want to ignore struggle alongside quote unquote conservatives. Um, yeah, if I, if I could jump in, I think um, this is a great question because look at the white male working class. I mean, um, it looks like about 72% of the white male working class voted for Donald Trump. So what does that say about our task and how do we learn to speak to these white workers? You know, th th there's some contradictory evidence. I mean, so there, there was the so-called blue wall of Michigan, Wisconsin, and um, Pennsylvania, uh, the Rust Belt um, that went for Trump in 2016. And now it looks like Biden at least succeeded in 
uh, rebuilding that blue wall, but without necessarily uh, winning over a lot of white workers. Um, so we have a major question in front of us of we want to build a united multiracial working class force. We have to do some really hard thinking about why is it that we are not winning over white workers and why are they following um, uh, an authoritarian chauvinist like Trump. Um, to me, this is like really key task, especially for uh, white socialist. Uh, we have to come to grips with this and understand why it is that we're, um, this, and this, is, this has gone on for a, a long, long time. When I, was, when I was in college, I wrote to the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee because I wanted to volunteer for um, organizing around civil rights um, this is back in 1965, and I got a wonderful letter back from SNCC telling me, uh, would you please go organize among coal miners in West Virginia? <laughs> and uh, they were absolutely right. That, that's exactly what I should have done and seen my main task being. So we have a lot of conservative chauvinist ideas that are ruling over white workers and, and that they have bought into and the socialist left is just consistently failing to, um, to tackle that problem and um, start working and, and, and trying to turn that situation around. Okay, our next question is from Jesse and I am going to unmute him so that he can ask it live. All right. Um, Going back to the uh, kind of beginning of Brandon's comments at the uh, uh, at the start of this uh, panel, I was just curious to, we've had a lot of like interesting historical tidbits brought out in this discussion, but I really want to like, you know, apply a contemporary lens to like what we're doing today. And I was just curious to the panel, you know, was the majority of the left's response to the Joe Biden campaign an example of a popular front? Uh, did we like, you know, kind of like hold our noses to vote for him and hold our tongues to criticize him in the period before the election because there was, you know, a disciplinary action or apparatus ready to like, you know, condemn the left for causing another Hillary Clinton like 2016 situation? Uh, or was this just, you know, another outgrowth of this popular front method that has been used by the American left time and time again? Uh, I'm also curious in relation to that, uh, if it is a popular front method, you know, uh, you know, we recently heard news of Debbie, uh, what is her name, um, of the Congresswoman from Virginia, the candidate from Quantico on the Democratic House Party conference call, Sponberger claimed that like, you know, uh, defunding the police, like, you know, nearly sank my campaign, you know, we have to like never talk about that kind of stuff again. Uh, in the situation in the popular front where, you know, the liberals cut you out, what is the, uh, <clears throat> what is the strategy after that? Um, so yeah, I can jump in on that. I think uh, the first part of the question was um, basically how the left about how the left responded to Joe Biden's um, candidacy for president and whether that would fall into a popular front framework. I'm gonna instead of getting bogged down in the question of whether it's a popular front or not, I'll just say that I didn't think it was. I do think that the most of the left's response to the Joe Biden presidency was inadequate or to the Joe Biden candidacy was inadequate. And I do think that if you look at, you know, the way AOC or other prominent, you know, people that are looked to on the, as like sort of left voices in, in mainstream media or whatever handled it, I think that it was insufficiently critical and Crucially, um, it did not point toward the need for any kind of break from the Democratic Party or any alternative. Um, and I think that that's a problem. I think, you know, we should be honest, like I supported Bernie and whatever, but Bernie Sanders does not believe in a dirty break. Bernie Sanders believes in trying to reform 
the Democratic Party, AOC does not believe in a dirty break. AOC does not advocate that. AOC advocates trying to reform the Democratic Party, um, at least for now. I hope over time, you know, that more forces will be be won towards a, a dirty break. But um, I think that, uh, yeah, basically, I think that um, liberal or that the the left should have been should have articulated a clear argument to say in swing states, um, vote for Joe Biden to get Trump out. Um, in safe states, vote for um, the strongest left third party candidate, which would have been Hawkins Walker in this case, um, as a protest vote to try and get the biggest percentage to, to send a message. But more important than either, or, you know, overall, no matter what state you're in, let's start campaigning to build a new party so that in four years, we're not back in the exact same situation and a party that can, you know, uh, fight on all these issues um, that come up under either one of the president. You know, that's the other thing is if you want to talk about harm reduction or whatever, the best harm reduction thing you can do is have a movement ready to mobilize against whoever gets into office and, um, and fight on the issues that matter to um, regular working people and oppressed people in this country. Um, and to do that both in election season and between elections. Uh, and that's how you're gonna you know, start building a force that is one day capable of you know, being viable in, in a situation like that. It's not gonna you know, just spring into existence um, overnight. And so I do think that there was a missed opportunity to articulate a sharp argument like that, um, that would have, you know, A, not opened the door to, to spoiler arguments, but still be like said, wherever we can, we should strive to take steps in the direction of, in, of a political independence, and we should start building the structures towards political independence in the here and now. And I should say, uh, Jesse has, um, sort of shortened and clarified the second part of his question in the chat uh, to how do you do the dirty break if the liberals are just going to condemn you for their election results if they lose? I, I guess I don't know that I would um, say that's coming from liberals. I guess the word I would use would be the centrist or um, maybe uh, more to the point, the uh, Democratic National Committee, which, I, I mean, you know, let's, Nancy Pelosi says we're a capitalist party, right? And uh, the DNC is guaranteed, uh, dedicated to making sure it remains a capitalist party. Um, but I, my feeling was that uh, AOC and Rashida Tlaib and others in the squad really have already gone on the offensive against that uh, uh, this argument that uh, progressives were responsible for um, some uh, uh, House Democrats losing in purple districts. And uh, they, to me, they just did a superb job showing that uh, progressives who advocated for um, the Green New Deal and Medicare for All actually won their elections. Um, and including in um, purple districts. So, um, <clears throat> that, but I, th I think we do have to be prepared for the fact that um, the DNC is probably going to come down very hard on AOC and the squad and people like newcomers like Cori Bush um, because they wanna definitely isolate that wing of the Democratic Party. Um, and it gives us an opportunity to, to show that um, who those people are, are really speaking for. They're really not speaking for the people. They're really not even for that matter, speaking for the future of the Democratic Party because uh, let's face it, uh, Biden won overwhelmingly because of the black vote and uh, the Latinx vote. Um, they are responsible for uh, his victory in Pennsylvania and Michigan, the turnout in Philadelphia, Allegheny County, uh, the turnout in Detroit. Uh, 
And Milwaukee turned all three of those states around. And in Georgia, overwhelmingly, the black vote was re is responsible for flipping uh, Georgia blue. And in Arizona, uh, the Latin and indigenous Native American vote are clearly uh, responsible for the edge that Biden enjoyed in Arizona. So to me, the progressive wing has great leverage now to, to counter uh, the centrist attempt to uh, squelch uh, the progressives within the Democratic Party. And I would want to add briefly that, you know, I think it's it's it, it shouldn't be underestimated that um, we as socialists are actually seriously debating the dirty break as a viable strategy. Right. That really speaks to the new terrain that we're on today. And I, I think that, um, you know, to, to offer another answer to I think Jesse's really pertinent question is that I, I envision the dirty break not as being like the Bernie Sanders and the AOCs and the Julia Salazar's, for example, who are also, oh, Julia Salazar's is not, maybe not so easily fit in that category, but say like the Bernie Sanders and the squad, right? Um, certain members of that group have done uh, a, a significant undeniable job to popularize words like socialism, right? But when I think about what the dirty break would look like and speaking to I think a key, uh, a, a key detail that Brandon said in his presentation, which is if the dirty break is going to work, the framework around what it is and what it should be should always be at the forefront of our minds, right? And I, and I feel as though the way that we actually accomplish that is that we actually build our own candidates. We build candidates in such a manner that one, we can begin to run them in areas in which they could potentially win and we do, do so in such a manner in which they are genuinely, um, they are, to put it bluntly, obedient to the organization. Um, and so I think that's how we conceptualize that. And in those areas in which we can win and we do win, I think when, when you know, uh, mainstream Democrats point the finger at us and say, you're making our jobs harder, we point the finger back and say, know what you're saying is that uh, we're running in areas in which we're advocating things that are very popular and you're just making it hard on yourselves because your interests are not actually in line with your supposed constituents. As much as we can, wherever we can, understanding that it's probably going to be quite limited for a while. All right, thank you all. Um, Next up, we have a question from Rosemary, who's also going to uh, issue it live on air. Yeah, thanks everybody so much. Um, I really agree with what Jad was just saying. Um, in some ways, my question is might have become a little bit redundant, but it also fits in uh, with what people are saying because it's about kind of the, the Bernie Craddock, uh, Bernie Craddock candidates that have been running. So while acknowledging that the working class desperately needs to build its own political independence, how should socialists relate to campaigns of social Democrats like AOC and Bernie, who are insisting on running within the Democratic Party? How can we support these campaigns while simultaneously trying to build an alternative to the Democrats? Um, there have been a lot of concerns on the left, including the socialist left, over supporting um, non-revolutionary candidates for office and potentially simultaneously granting legitimacy to the Democratic Party. But it's it's really clear to me and a lot of us that we should be trying to fight alongside of and influence and recruit from the radicalizing workers supporting these candidates. So how do we walk that line between, I guess, being opportunistic about these social democratic campaigns, but um, also being you know too ultra left to engage in a positive way? And that question's for everybody. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a really crucial question um, that, of course, could have a panel of its own, uh, frankly. Um, but to sort of, yeah, keep the discussion going, since it is along lines of sort of what we've been talking about, I think that um, 
you know, one thing that, that uh, I think most of the left has done a good job of engaging um, if the, I'll just say with the Bernie Sanders campaign and the squad and stuff like that, I think the, the portion of the left that takes an ultra left stand apart from that approach um, is quite, I think, small and marginalized um, relative to the movement at this stage. Um, the, um, so I, I won't focus on that, so, but I do think that the question of how do you support it in a way that's sort of not um, opportunist or is not um, sort of sowing illusions in the ability to reform the Democrats or, or um, that these campaigns themselves are the way that things are gonna go down. I think that's really important. And um, so, yeah, I think that's where pointing towards the need for a break, even as we're supporting people like Bernie and AOC and, and you know, frankly debating, uh, saying that this is a point where we disagree with Bernie and AOC just because we're endorsing them doesn't mean we can't express, um, you know, disagreement on individual points or whatever. Um, and furthermore, I think it's something that Bernie and AOC needed to do more themselves in addressing Joe Biden and that I think like it made sense, like I said, I would have advocated, I think it made sense for them to, um, especially in swing states, you know, advocate a vote, but I think they did more than that. I think they went further and said that, you know, basically tried to give left cover to Joe Biden in a way saying like, could be the most progressive administration, you know, uh, since FDR and, you know, uh, gonna bring about all these really important transformative changes for working people or whatever. Whereas for me, the starting point is just like Donald Trump, Joe Biden is an enemy of the working class. And um, that doesn't, it doesn't mean that I am uh, agnostic to the question of divisions within the enemy camp. You know, it matters to me which enemy is on the other side of those battle lines um, that we're gonna be fighting. And I would rather have Joe Biden there than, than Donald Trump, but let's call a spade a spade and be honest with people um, that Joe Biden is, is an enemy and we will be fighting him. And anything else, uh, we can say that and say, and we wanna get him elected. Um, and I think that that's something we need to learn how to do in general is to, to be able to have two seemingly contradictory things be true at once because um, reality is complicated like that. And, um, and those contradictions are real. So um, I think that's something that, that is important in that, that process to be able to be, be honest about sort of seemingly conflicting truths at the same time and to be open about what we really believe is gonna be necessary. I don't think we should sort of restrict ourselves to only making the points right now that we think are already gonna get popular support, majority support or whatever. I think we need to be making those points, but then use that as a bridge to, to start bringing in the, start sowing the seeds of the, the arguments of the needs, the need for a break, the need for a socialist transformation of society, these types of things. Um, even if most people aren't gonna be on board yet, I think that's not gonna, people are not so fickle as like, oh, you said one thing I kind of don't get or don't disagree with, or that I disagree with. So I'm not gonna, um, you know, uh, so I'm not gonna follow you, or I'm not gonna listen to you or I don't support you anymore or whatever. I think um, people disagreed with plenty of what Joe Biden stood for and they voted for him anyway. So I think um, we can feel free to, to say what we really think also. I think when it dawns on people that uh, Biden uh, represents the status quo ante, it's gonna be a very radicalizing force uh, on progressives in the Democratic Party. Uh, I mean, he's already talking about bringing Republicans into his administration. Some of the cabinet uh, figures uh, that he's floating like Rahm Emanuel, for God's sakes. Um, when people see this, they're going to say, what the hell did we do? <laughs> you know, I didn't, I didn't want to go back to the worst aspects of the past. Um, and, you know, um, we recently had a meeting with Senator Ron Wyden's staff about 
um, speaking out on Palestine finally. And um, the response we got from the staff was actually like, well, Senator Wyden is looking for bipartisan support for anything that he wants to sign on to. I mean, the Republican Party has degenerated into a hate group. I, it's, you know, uh, under Donald Trump, it's the core essence of the Republican Party has become so obvious that how anybody in the Democratic Party can start reaching out to them and calling for a bipartisanship. It's just that ought to shock anyone who uh, is seeking any kind of progressive change. So I, I think that um, this is a rock that uh, the centrist Democrats are lifting to only to drop on their own feet. I think to add, because I think I just saw Daniel Jacobs ask a question, and I think it fits nicely into what we've been discussing, if I may just jump into that. So I think to start, when we speak with people about these issues, as has been said, we shouldn't be afraid to be completely honest about our own political perspectives, right? And I think that sometimes we're afraid to do so because I think many of us have come up in a left that has been much more isolated than it is today. And we're just used to people looking at us as though we just, we've completely lost our minds. So one, that's no longer the issue anymore, not that we're on the cusp of revolution. But even if it were, we should still be honest with people as to what our political perspectives are because we want to win people over to those political perspectives. And we don't do so by hiding them from people that we assume may be afraid of them. Now, using that as a starting off point, why is uh, why is Joe Biden, why if Joe Biden is an enemy, why is Biden preferable, a preferable enemy to Trump? I think because of the political terrain that a Biden, Biden presidency creates, I think that we shouldn't, you know, underestimate and, and you know, we all understand this, that the liberals do control so much more of the mainstream political narrative than we do. And I think it's worth pointing out that when, uh, that when a Democrat is in office, that opens up a space of agitation for socialists that just doesn't exist uh, to the same degree when a Republican is in office. I think it's worth noting that um, uh, Occupy Wall Street was an Obama era uh, moment. So was the first uh, Black Lives Matter uprising. I think that the liberals are so, you know, in a Trump presidency, what do the liberals get to do by, to maintain their ideological hegemony? It's Trump's fault, it's Trump's fault, it's Trump's fault, it's Trump's fault. With Biden in the presidency, that ability to advocate in such a manner is not absolutely destroyed. Like the like, Democrats haven't just automatically lost their ability to dominate mainstream politics, but a crack has appeared. And that's where we as socialists, I think, look for cracks in bourgeois ideology. All right, thank you so much, guys. Um, so a couple of things. I apologize because I think there's a, another uh, person on the question stack that we're not going to get to get to because we are um, approaching the end of our time here. Um, but I actually was going to kind of selfishly take advantage, advantage of my moderator privilege and um, sort of pose a question that people can either choose or not choose to weave into your closing remarks. Um, and that is Rod identified uh, the fact that Bernie Sanders, and I think we could probably extend this to people like uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, Rashida Tlaib, Ilhan Omar, um, and even entire countries like, uh, you know, the Scandinavian nations and Venezuela, um, all take on distinctly, I think what we might agree to be progressive characteristics. And yet, all of these things are identified um, in sort of popular consciousness as socialist or socialism. Um, 
And I guess I'd just like to raise the question of, you know, what is this kind of mistaken identity mean for us? Is this um, potentially an opportunity or is it an obstacle to us uh, accomplishing what we, what we want to do? And um, I think with that, we're gonna go in the same order for closing remarks that uh, we opened with. So I will allow Brandon to uh, lead us off. Cool. Um, how long are these supposed to be? I didn't. I didn't actually realize we had closing remarks. Just take about five minutes or less. Great. Um, well, yeah. I think this has been a great discussion. There's obviously lots more to get to, but luckily we are all able to keep talking um, as comrades going forward. So I think um, this doesn't have to be the end of these discussions on these topics, it should be just the beginning. Um, and to Conrad's question about whether, um, you know, whether it's Sweden or Venezuela or whatever these places that people call socialist, but that, yeah, I would agree are not, not what I would call socialist, um, you know, is that nonetheless an opening for us or is it a problem? I think, you know, to me, uh, it's both, you know, it's on the one hand, I think it's an opening because it makes socialism something that's, at least in the case of Scandinavian countries or whatever, it makes uh, socialism be like something that's not so scary or whatever to people. It's something more, seems more accessible or whatever, and so makes people more open to hear about it and discuss it. Um, and it's, you know, you have the opportunity to explain why, you know, well, actually, they, you know, the corporations still control the means of production in general, and, you know, IKEA is not a socialist corporation, and whatever, you know, you can um, have those discussions, but it's a good starting point anyway, um, if people have that in mind, and, and you can go further. Um, it's certainly um, a better preconception for people to have in mind, in my opinion, than, um, you know, the um, say Stalin in the Soviet Union or whatever. I think that was a, a scarier, um, you know, preconception for people to think of when they think socialism um, than Scandinavia is, and uh, harder to for that to be a conversation starter instead of a conversation ender. So in that sense, it's good. Um, Venezuela is a bit more complicated. I think yeah, there's people who just will use. Venezuela as an example to shut down any any discussion about that, but nonetheless, I think um, I think the way that it helps is that it you know shows that uh, there are this isn't just some socialism isn't just some abstract idea in people's heads that there are people struggling for it in uh, places around the world and and are attempting to, to find their way in the direction of it or whatever. I think to the extent that people think what actually exists, exists or existed in countries like Venezuela is, is socialism. I think that is, that is a problem. That is an obstacle that we have to get past um, in, uh, because yeah, people A, confuse the problems of poverty with the problems of, um, a socialist economy, but B, don't understand the extent to which the economy is not socialized and that um, was not able to reap many of those benefits and where, where there's plenty of um, capitalist style corruption still in place and things like that. But just to take it full circle um, and sort of try and close out um, my portion of the discussion, I think um, I didn't come in on this earlier, but I think the example people brought up of Black Lives Matter and the demonstrations that have happened in Portland and um, the need to orient to them are absolutely correct. And I think like this is that is a very good example of a case where I think you know we as DSA should should have oriented more strongly and earlier and more boldly. And I say that um, not because not just because I think like DSA could have recruited out of it, which I do think is true, but because I think it it's doing a, it's not for our sake, but uh, for the sake of the movement. I think it would have been helpful to the movement um, to bring a socialist uh, 
program of action and that there would have been people excited that there were socialists trying to organize discussion on the way forward in the movement and would have wanted to plug into that. Um, and so I think we have, we don't want to be higher, high and mighty and think we have all the answers, but I think we also uh, don't, we also need to realize that we do have a unique and valuable contribution to make to the movement. And um, if we sort of become too shy to do that, then it is not just us that's missing out, it's the movement that's missing out. And um, and so I do think that's where it, be, it becomes important to have these bold types of engagements where we are both fully engaged in the real on the ground struggles and the questions and issues that come up and really say what we really think on those issues in those contexts. And I think if we're confident in those ideas, we should be confident that other people will you know, see the value in those ideas and, and come to them. And, and we should also be not afraid to reevaluate our ideas if we feel like they aren't working in those contexts. Um, so it's important for ourselves as well in our own education to, to have that real experience and test the ideas out in practice. All right, thank you so much. Uh, Rod, you are up next. So I, I think I'll just conclude with uh, trying to give a more well-rounded answer to the question of how should socialists relate to progressives. Organizationally, we need to work in progressive organizations, uh, even if our views don't hold sway, uh, with an understanding that our differences are not antagonistic. Uh, there can be contradictions among the people, and those contradictions require patient education. Uh, often in the course of seeing people learn through their own direct experience. Um, we should strive to bring more working class leadership into progressive organizations so that those struggles center a working class as opposed to a middle class perspective. Ideologically, we need to recognize that progressives will sometimes vacillate and settle for reforms that fail to strengthen uh, working class and oppressed communities. Um, that requires that we engage and struggle with ideas that either directly or indirectly reinforce capitalist hegemony. Strategically, socialists need to articulate a vision or a strategy for how progressive movements can help build mass struggle around demands that are key demands for undermining capitalist hegemony and building working class power. And those are namely the struggles against white supremacy, male supremacy, war and empire. There are a multitude of struggles and we need to play the keyboard by being involved in as many as possible but we also need to recognize which chords on the keyboard resonate the most. Thank you so much. And uh, Jed, you have the honor of taking us home. Um, and I didn't forget you this time, so that's good. <laughs> Thanks, Conrad. Um, so, uh, you know, I'll, I'll close out by, by attempting to add a little bit more to the question that you had posed us, um, which is, I think that, yes, um, when we look at these states that I would argue are not actually socialist states, um, they do pose both uh, opportunities and challenges. Uh, uh, much, I, I don't want to retread the ground that Brandon has already covered. I think, uh, again, though, it does, you know, a, a fantastic opportunity is that, you know, it allows us to advocate for what we actually are as socialists. You know, we want to win better reforms and we want to win welfare for workers in the here and now, but our ultimate goal is a worldwide society that is devoid of classes and ultimately devoid of states as well. And I think that that allows us when possible to make that argument in an effective manner and that we can even take a look at the social democracies of Europe, right? Take a look at any, any nation state uh, that, that, that provides a degree of welfare to its people, and you will see that welfare program constantly under attack. And essentially, that's what we're fighting against. We're fighting against a world that is structured and organized around profit, and therefore is always a world in which those who labor are at risk 
of losing the benefits of a dignified, healthy, happy life. All right, Jed, thank you so much for that. Um, and thank you to all of our panelists. Thank you to all of the audience members who showed up and especially the ones who asked questions. Your sacrifice is not forgotten. Um, I left a link in the chat for a reading group that uh, the political education working group has coming up. So if you're interested, please attend that. Um, and we hope to see you all again in the future. If you want to rewatch this panel, you will be able to do so uh, on the Portland DSA YouTube channel. Um, so have a good night, everyone. And uh, I guess we